So, um, <laughs> a good friend of mine, he works in the music industry. He works for MTV. And I wouldn't call him arrogant, but let's say he's very proud to work in the music industry. And recently we had a little argument, a little discussion about what's better if you work in the music industry or if you work in the games industry. And of course my friend said, well, music industry, much better. You, have, you work with celebrities all the time, like Rihanna, and uh, the people are more trendy, more cool. Well, I think it's both are very creative industries, but what I like about the games industry more, I think people are a bit more down to earth, a bit more authentic, and a bit more humble. And I was telling my friend that I'm going to Hamburg talk about cross-platform technology in, in the games industry, and then he said, um, oh yeah, cross-platform. That's, uh, that's big in the music industry. That's, that's, we do that for several years. It's very, very important in music. Um, and I, I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should take a closer look at what they do in, in the music industry because sometimes it helps to look outside the box a little and, and look at other industries. So I did a bit research on, on that. And what I found was another photo of uh, Rihanna on, on this device which I hadn't seen before. Um, does any of you know what this is called, this, this box? I hadn't, I hadn't seen it. It's called um, the squeeze box from Logitech. And what it does, it's you can stream your music Wi-Fi from music networks, or it's, it's also called a music network player. So it, if you have Spotify, for example, you can stream your music to that box and then play all the music literally in the world from that box. And um, I'm sure everybody knows Spotify. It's a very good example of cross-platform technology in the music industry because if you have a Spotify account and subscription, you can access pretty much all the music in the world on, on all these devices, on the squeeze box, on your PC, on your mobile phone. And they have an API, so there are several apps that use it now, like Shazam. And of course, it's also connected to social networks, so you can share with your friends what music you're listening to and, and see what your friends are listening to. Another example from music is, of course, Apple, which if you have an iTunes account, then you can access your music and your media through all the Apple devices on your, on your iPad, on your iMac, on your MacBook, on, on the phone. And now it's all connected through the iCloud. It's all synchronized, and you have permanent access to, to all, all the files. So the music industry, indeed, as my, as my friend said, is cross-platform technology is already a reality there. And companies like Spotify and Apple that embrace that technology have seen some tremendous revenue and growth opportunities in the recent years. So the question is, how are we in the games industry comparing to that? What's, what's the, the state of cross-platform technology in our industry? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the first question is, what is actually cross-platform? technology. Because a lot of companies talk about it, a lot of companies say, yeah, we're, we're doing cross-platform. But what makes a cross-platform experience? And the way we see it, there's several components to it that make it cross-platform. And if you will, it's like several levels. And with every level, it gets more advanced and more powerful. And I'm going to show you the, the five levels that I think are the, the main levels of, of cross-platform. And the first, the most basic level is that you take your brands, your game brands, and move them to other platforms. So in our example, these are all games from our own company, from GameDoll. We have 60 titles on our own website. And seven of those titles, all these seven, we also have on, on other platforms. So we have them on social networks and on, on Android, on iPhone. Here's an example, one of our games, Bubble Speed, that's the, the game brand Bubble Speed that we, you can play it on our own website on gamedoyle.com. And you can also play it on Facebook. And you can play it on the iPhone. Then the next level of cross-platform is when you market also a cross-platform. So you have um, many channels, of course, where you can market cross-platform. Uh, here's an example from Facebook. If a user plays Bubble Speed on Facebook, and then he, he opens the Facebook app on the mobile phone, then there will be a bookmark, as you can see in the middle of the screenshot, bubble speed that Facebook puts in there. If, if we tell Facebook that we have the, a, a version of the game also on mobile, 
and it's the same app ID, then they will automatically put the bookmark in there and then it links to the app store or depending on what you have Android or if you have an HTML5 version of the game, it opens it directly in your mobile browser. And we all know how powerful cross promotion is on one platform, on Facebook for example. A lot of companies, they, they get the most part of their traffic through internal cross promotion and that's very powerful and it's also very powerful if you do it across platforms. Now the third level is then to share the social graph of your users across the platforms. Here's an example again from bubble speed when that's all from the mobile version. So if you install the mobile version we will ask the user to connect to his Facebook account and about 50 percent of the users will actually do that. So it's quite a, a large number and then for them the, the whole game experience will become much richer because they can see their friends that play the game. If they played it on Facebook or if they played mobile they see it both and they see the scores of their friends and we build something into the gameplay that makes it more fun and so if you if you pass a score of your friend then you will get a reward in game currency you will get some gems. So you have an incentive to invite more friends into the game um, and connect. The third no the fourth level then is to also share the virtual economy of the game and that is a bit more complicated because you really need then a shared database. Um, for example, if a user buys some in-game currency, in this case gems, or he buys some boosts in, in the game and he buys it on Facebook and then he later he uses his mobile version, then he has access to exactly the same in-game currency and the same boost. So if he or lives also in, in games that have lives, if you play on mobile you lose a life, then you go back to Facebook, then the life is gone. Or if you buy some boosts on Facebook, you go to mobile, you can play with, with the same boosts. That's, that's of course a much richer experience if you have that in the game. And the, the fifth level which is the most complex one and it's particularly nice for multiplayer games um, is when you also have the gameplay itself connected across platforms. So here's an example from Words with Friends from Zynga where you can play that game on all devices against other players and it might be that you play the game on Facebook and you play against your friend who's playing it on the mobile phone or you start the game on Facebook and then you go home and on the subway you play, continue the game on your mobile phone. It's, it's exactly the same game. It can, can be played across all the devices. So the more of these five levels you have built into your, your games, the more of a true cross-platform experience becomes and the more of the benefits of cross platform you will experience as a company. The question is then of course why do not more companies do that? Why don't we see more cross platform? And the answer is quite simple. It's, it's very complex to do that. Um, you have to suddenly you have more technology at the same time. You have several teams working on the same game on different platforms. You have to test on more platforms you have organizationally it's, it becomes quite a challenge to do that and you have to build the right te technology to do it. Um, so the, the path to becoming a cross platform company is quite difficult and I want to share with you now some of those, some of the lessons that we've learned from going from a one platform to a multi cross platform company in the past years. So here's a little history of our company Game Duel. We started eight years ago as a true one platform company. We started in Berlin uh, end of 2003 and what we built our, our initial product was a website where people can play social games like card games, multiplayer games in competitions against other players and they can win prizes when they play. And we were profitable pretty fast. After nine months we were profitable and then expanded uh, into other European markets, into France, into um, other countries and then in 2008 also went to the United States, opened an office in San Francisco and got venture funding, uh, 70 million dollars. And then you can see in 2009 something happened, something fundamentally changed in our company. That's when we decided to go and open up more platforms. And the first one was Facebook. We, 
we took our games to Facebook and then we added iPhone, iPad, Android, and now we're also working with HTML5. And you can really see how the, the, the orange graph, that's the number of users that we have, really got steeper from that time on. And that's not just because we added the platforms, but it's in particular because of the synergistic effects that we've seen from being on these platforms and connecting all the platforms. And what you don't see on that graph is what happened in the last two years in parallel in the company, because it was a, a very difficult process to, to enable that um, technology-wise, organizational-wise. We had to go through a lot of change in the company, and, and we learned quite a lot in, in the last two years in doing so. And the biggest learnings I'm going to share with you now um, of becoming a cross-platform company. So the first lesson is it's really important to, to focus because if you have more platforms, if it becomes more complex, it, it becomes more dangerous that you screw it up. So it's, it's like changing your car from a normal car into a Formula One racing car. And then you're, you're driving at high speed. And that's why the cockpit in, in these cars is so uh, reduced. So the driver can really focus on, on what's happening. Um, so you have, to, you have to focus on everything you do. You cannot build features that are unnecessary. You have to really um, have high quality in the code that you develop. Because if you make a mistake in, in the base code, then it multiplies to all the platforms. And you have to select one platform that's going to be your lead platform, where you develop the game first and test and get the gameplay right, and then you move it to the other platforms. And we chose for mobile, for example, we chose Android as our lead development platform, because Android is faster to develop and test and iterate than on iOS. The second lesson is that you need really very good, excellent analytics. And there's been a lot of talks about data today. Um, so it's, it's nothing new that games companies today have to be very data and metrics oriented. But if you go cross-platform, that becomes even more important. It has to be part of your, your DNA. And I've seen a lot of companies that, that use data but they don't use it in the right way. So there's a big difference of looking just at the data. Data is it's kind of worthless. You have to make information out of the data, and that's a skill to really look at the right data and to analyze it in the right way. I've seen people looking at spreadsheets, looking at some split tests, and they draw the wrong conclusions out of that. So you ne really need to have the right people in the team to do that, and you have to make the right test. There's a really nice book about the whole topic of Innovation accounting, I'm sure a lot of people know it. Eric Ries, lead startup. Um, and what you have to do is then also build the right infrastructure for that. So we've built a, a database, it's a Hadoop database, where all our different platforms feed into. The tracking feeds into, into this database. And we've built the tools to visualize the data that helps the product managers, for example, to make faster decisions when they test things, when they do split testing, cohort testing. And of course, you also track the traffic across the different platforms and follow the user. And you have to know which user is on what platform, which users are on several platforms, how do they behave, what's their path. Then you can use that to optimize the experience for the users. The third lesson is to use or to create synergies. And there's many ways you can do it. Um, graphics is an example. In, in the beginning, we built our games uh, only for the web, so when we first took the game and made a mobile version out of it, we couldn't use the graphics anymore because we, we hadn't built them to work on mobile devices. So now when we build a, a game today, we build the graphics from beginning on with that in mind. So we have the graphics in higher resolutions and make them in dynamic sizes so they can fit on, on several displays. It's just one example. Um, payment infrastructure is another example where you, we build one infrastructure that all the platforms access and use. And you can use the same payment partners across platforms, same marketing partners across platforms. And the most important is to have a common technology, common core technology. There's companies that offer that, so you don't have to build it yourself. I was just talking to a company yesterday that, that do exactly that. But we decided to build our own core technology to be more flexible. And that's kind of how it looks like. So we have. In the middle, we have shared components, like a shared user database, shared accounting, shared reporting, 
shared uh, competition services for the multiplayer games, matchmaking, um, and around that we have all the different platforms and front ends. And it's all standardized. So when we develop a new feature, let's say on mobile, a new competition or tournament type, then it f it's built into the core technology so that the other platforms can also use that component very fast. So that, of course, makes your development faster. Initially, it's slower because you have to build into the, the core technology and there's, you have to have very good people because it has to be a high standard of code and flexible. But once it's in there, then the other platforms can use it easily and so you're faster. When we initially build a game, it takes about four months. And then when we adapt it to other platforms, we do it in several weeks. The fourth lesson is to be really customer driven because it doesn't make sense just to be cross-platform and build things to be cross-platform. It always has to be coming from the user. There has to be a user value behind it. So you have to ask yourself, what is the value of that feature? There are some features like a single sign-on that makes total sense because the user doesn't want to log into every platform again uh, new. So you have one shared database. Um, and there's a lot of cross-platform features that make sense, like seeing which of your friends are now online on what platform and um, making tools that enable people to challenge them across platforms. These features make sense, but there's also a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. Again, you have to focus on, on those. And understand what are the differences in the user types on each platform. There are subtle differences, what the people prefer on social networks and on our own side, they like more. On our own side, for example, people are like more intense gameplay. They, that's the people that, that are looking for more thrill, adrenaline when they play the competition modes. On mobile, it's more about achievement where people like features where you can play the level again and then if you master it very fast and you get extra stars. So these kind of features that are attractive for different um, audience groups. And then what you do, you filter your audience, you identify, you use predictors to identify what kind of user is it and then you funnel them to the platform where you can monetize them the best. The fifth lesson kind of ties into that. Um, you have to be platform specific. So while the, the core gameplay may be the same on each platform, if you just port the game and copy it to the other platform, it won't work. You have to adapt it to the platform because every platform has some unique um, characteristics that you have to take into account, especially in terms of usability. For mobile phones, the usability is a much bigger challenge than on a website. On a website, you can get away with a lot of crap, um, but on mobile, because there's, the user flow is so focused on, on that small screen, you have to be really good. That's why there's um, some people like uh, Luke Roblowski who say, there's a very good presentation from him called Mobile First, and he says you should develop your, your game or the usability um, first on the mobile device because you're for, it forces you really to think extremely clear and only put the, the things in that are really necessary and throw out all the rest, all the garbage. And then when you take that usability and use it on the other platforms, then they will be much better. And we've tried that. We've tried um, building some features that we, that we had on mobile phones where we had to Im improve the flow to make it clearer and easier for the user and then we took that flow and put it back on the version on the web and then uh, we tested it and it was better in terms of the metrics in the web version too. Um, also you can reinvent and innovate for each platform. So for mobile there's a lot more sensors and, and tools you can use. You can take advantage of like when you move the phone and, and then we change the background graphics. So it's a better experience and just little gimmicks, but Apple likes that a lot. So we had our games featured several times because of these little gimmicks in the game. Um, and very important, of course, is the controls of the game, especially on mobile devices. So here's an example from a game, um, Fossil Fever, that we have on the web, and we're right now working on the mobile version of it. And we had to completely change the, the interaction with the game for the mobile version because with the finger, you, you have smaller spaces where you can tap, and we even built a whole new way to, to move the, the blocks, and we tested that. So if you do all these steps of cross-platform, you can see some very nice benefits out of it. Um, it impacts your acquisition, it impacts your monetization, and it impacts your 
retention. So in terms of acquisition, what you can do when you have several platforms, you can, of course, source your traffic through different channels. And you have more options for marketing. You have more channels available, and um, the cost per install, the acquisition costs for marketing are different on each channel. So you can take advantage of that and, and buy the traffic in the cheaper channel and then funnel it over to your platforms where you have better monetization, um, which will result in a, in a lower cost per install. And it also helps if you have already a fan base on one platform, and then you can leverage that when you go to another platform. You, the brand will be recognized by the users, so you have higher click-through rates on your ads. Um, and of course, you can do cross-promotion. And also, what, we, what we've seen is much higher virality. The, the installs we get for free, or we, we, we don't know where, we, where they come from, they're much higher since we have, when we have a game on, on multiple platforms. And of course, one nice effect is also that you're independent from, from one single channel, like for Facebook. If you're a developer of Facebook games, then you're extremely dependent on whatever Facebook is doing. If you have multiple platforms, then you can always use your traffic from other platforms to compensate when there's changes. Um, better monetization also. So you have more ways how you can monetize your users. Um, every platform has some specifics. And you can, what we do, for example, we, we um, use our, the social networks, Facebook, as a marketing channel. And then, because there you, we can build reach uh, easily. Um, and then the goal is not to build uh, a lot of DAU, but rather to take the users and move them over to our other platforms, because there we monetize them much higher. And more than 10 times higher monetization on our own website than on Facebook. And also mobile, it's, it's better. That's why we then funnel the users through the different platforms. Um, you have also synergistic effects. So we see that users that are using several platforms at the same time have up to 70% higher monetization than those users that are only on one platform. That's why, for us, it's, it's not. Um, in, initially, we thought it's cannibalizing if we send users away to another platform, but we, we realized it's actually a positive effect when you send users on multiple platforms because they interact with your brand and with your product more often. And it has an impact also on retention. And that's, I think, the most important uh, benefit of cross-platform that you give your users access to your games anytime, anywhere. And there's many more channels and contact and touch points for you and your customers. So you have more CRM channels where you can send them like push notifications, email. Um, they, they get in touch with your brand more often. And as a result, they remain active much longer. We, can, we see um, up to 2.5 times higher probability of users to remain active after 90 days if they are engaging on several of our platforms at the same time. So I, I talked about this topic uh, last year in Seattle. And back then, it was still people were a bit skeptical and saying, OK, cross-platform, is that really going to be important in, in the games industry. I think today it's no longer the question if it's going to be important. We, we see um, many companies doing it. And just like in the music industry, we see that consumers are beginning to expect it to be able to use your, your games on all devices or many devices. So I think if you, my, my, my final advice today to to companies that are not doing cross-platform yet would be not to, to ask yourself you know, if you can afford it to do cross-platform, because it is complex, it is difficult. But the question is rather if you can afford not to do cross-platform. <clears throat> Thanks. Questions, please. Um, hi. I have a question. Um, do you think that um, HTML5 could be a leading technology to develop cross-platform games? I think it could be, yes. And we're experimenting with it at the moment a lot. But I would honestly say that it's too early to, to say this is going to be the 
future technology for cross-platform because there are still too many issues with, uh, with it, depending on what kind of games you're making. Um, but at the moment, I think it's too early to say, but I think it's a, if you can afford it, then you should definitely test it and, and work with it. Because Facebook is, is uh, putting a lot of priority on HTML5, and they will push it uh, a lot this year, and if you have some content in HTML5, you get, can take uh, advantage of, of that. They will give you a lot of free traffic and featuring so if you have something that works in HTML5, definitely go for it. And another question about the uh, um, marketplaces like the iOS store or Facebook. You have to give, um, um, if, if, um, you have, if, if you buy your virtual currency in the, in the app store, is it a problem? For example, I'm on the, um, I'm on the iPhone playing the game and I bought the virtual goods on the desktop, is it a problem for Apple that they don't get the revenues from this transaction? It depends really on, on the platform. You have to look at each platform is different. Um, I think in the end, they will, everybody will understand that if the, if the user has a better experience through it, they will, they will allow that. But there are still some platforms where it's a problem. And you have to, there's workarounds, which you can do, but um, I think eventually it will be, the world will be like that, that you buy a currency, it's like you buy a music and you can use it on all the platforms. Why, why not? You bought it. Hi. Hello there. Over here. Other side. Hello. I'm over here. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, I've been a fan of the idea of cross-platform games for a very, very long time, and uh, obviously they've been doing it in Korea a long time. But there's a problem, I think, that's, that's, it's more, there, there's lots of complications. Obviously, you've talked about some of them, but I think there's some hidden ones. I think the mode of use of device uh, is a, an interesting problem. You know, everything that I do with one particular device is geared to the way I interact with it. So you know, when I'm using my phone, I need to be interruptible. When I'm using my tablet, I'm probably... Um, you know, a little bit more settled, a little, you know, but I'm using it in a different way than I would if I'm using my PC. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any sort of views on how you get around that um, problem of kind of behavioral use of devices and encourage people to actively use different di the same game on different experiences? How do you actually get past that? Um, I think it's for the user, it's, it's good to have a little bit different experience on each device. Or that's what I said, when, when you take it to another device, you adapt it to the device. And then you can also, there's ways to incentivize users to, to check out your game on other devices or install it on mobile version. You can build it into the game, like you can build awards that you can only get if you uh, play the mobile version. Or you can have some limited items that you only get um, if you play it in the mobile version. And then you can use it uh, as a boost on Facebook. And that makes it quite attractive. You know, EA have been talking about 247 interaction with the brand for about 10 years, mm. and they still haven't managed to get a sufficient critical mass of users to, well, in my opinion, and I think others as well, <coughs> they, they still have struggled to have the same audiences um, transferring from one game on one device to the same game on a different device. Mm. And I, th I think there's some fundamental questions on how we approach game design around a platform layer as well as the specifics of the device itself. I think it's also a question of, of the size of the company. If you have, if you're a very small uh, developer, then maybe you cannot uh, afford a team that can build on all these platforms. But then there's tools you can use that do that for you, um, frameworks you can use. Um, if you're a larger company, then you, you probably cannot get around it because the benefits from it are so big that if you have a competitive disadvantage if you're not taking, doing it. Uh, here. Uh, last question. Last question, okay. Uh, just to, to, to get back to the previous question that was, uh, if you pay on one platform, such as Facebook using Facebook credits, and then you're using the gems uh, on your iPhone version of the same game, I heard that companies were banned from the App Store because of that, because they were using uh, virtual <coughs> currencies that came from another platform. Mm -hmm. You just say that there was workarounds. Uh, could you confirm that uh, Facebook and iOS are 
not yet matching together on that. And could you explain what are the workarounds you were talking about? No, I can't uh, talk about that. I'm not so, uh, I, I don't know at the moment. I can't explain the details. But uh, you can give me your card and I get back to you about it. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.